This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 61, coming up on Space Time. The historic first ever detection of a black hole devouring a neutron star. Jupiter's ancient planetary collision. And India's moon mission enters lunar orbit. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. The astronomical community's in overdrive following reports of the possible first ever detection of gravitational waves generated by a black hole devouring a neutron star. Neutron stars and stellar mass black holes are both the super dense remains of dead stars far more massive than the Sun. The yet to be confirmed event, catalogued as S1908 14 BV, was detected by the LIGO and Virgo Gravitational Wave Observatories at 2111 Greenwich Mean Time on August the 14th. Early calculations suggest the event occurred somewhere around 900 million light years away. LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, comprises two identical facilities, one in Livingston, Louisiana, the other in Hanford, Washington State. Each LIGO observatory fires lasers into a beam splitter, which then shoots the beams along two perpendicular 4-kilometer long tubes equipped with mirrors at the far ends. The reflected laser light is then bounced back to a detector where eventually they should theoretically recombine. As a gravitational wave generated by something like moving mass or merging black holes passes through the cosmos, it causes the very fabric of space-time to stretch and compress ever so slightly, by just a fraction the diameter of a proton. When a gravitational wave passes through the LIGO detectors, local space-time, including the two beamlines reflected lasers, are stretched and compressed ever so slightly, leaving them out of phase, the signature of the gravitational wave event. Using multiple gravitational wave detectors allows scientists to determine the direction of the wave source. The recent addition of a third detector called Virgo near Pisa in northern Italy has further improved detection. A fourth observatory, Japan's Kamioka gravitational wave detector, is the first to be built underground and is expected to come online in the next few months. And a fifth gravitational wave detector, originally offered to Australia but rejected by the then Gillard Labor government, is now being built in India. Early reports from LIGO to NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, says that if the candidate event is of astrophysical origin, then there's strong evidence that the lighter compact object has a mass of less than three solar masses and a negligible probability of having any disrupted material outside the final compact object. And that all fits nicely with the accepted mass range of a neutron star, which is between the Chandrasekhar limit of electron degeneracy of 1.4 solar masses and 2.6 solar masses recently established as the upper mass limit for a neutron star. The smallest black hole ever detected by gravitational waves was a stellar mass black hole around 5 solar masses. The gravitational wave signature shows that the frequency increased faster than that from the collision of two neutron stars, and slower than that from the merger of two black holes. Professor Susan Scott from the Australian National University says the discovery completes a long sought-after gravitational wave trifecta of observations on the original LIGO wish list, which included the mergers of two black holes and the collision of two neutron stars. Scott, who's leader of the General Relativity Theory and Data Analysis Group at ANU and a chief investigator with OSGRAV, the Australian Research Council's Centre of Excellence for Gravitational Wave Discovery, says this cataclysmic event happened about 8,550 million trillion kilometres away, with the gravitational waves rippling through space for the past 900 million years until they finally reached the detectors on Earth. Scott says the ANU SkyMapper telescope responded to the detection alert, scanning the entire likely region of space where the event occurred, but they've not found any visual confirmation. The fact that there's been no detection of any corresponding electromagnetic radiation signatures could mean that they're simply looking in the wrong place, or it could be that the black hole consumed the neutron star in such a way that it prevented it from breaking apart outside the black hole's event horizon. Scott says, while there's a slight but intriguing possibility that the swallowed object was a very low-mass black hole, much lighter than any other black hole we know of in the universe, the observations most likely represent a stellar-mass black hole consuming a very dense neutron star like Pac-Man, possibly snuffing out the star instantaneously. At this stage, the most likely kind of event we believe this could be is 
the act of a black hole swallowing a neutron star in a binary system. You've been looking at black holes merging with other black holes and you've managed to find lots of those. Back in August, I think it was 2017, we discovered the first neutron star merging with a neutron star and that was very exciting because you could see that invisible wavelength as well as gravitational wavelength, not just visible, all through the electromagnetic spectrum. And now this is the first, if confirmed, the first neutron star black hole merger and that, that's really exciting. It is exciting and as you say, that if it stands up, that will complete the trifecta. And we've obviously believed that there are binary systems out there in the universe consisting of a black hole and a neutron star. But if we confirm this event, then this would actually confirm the existence of those type of binaries, and it would be the first observation of them actually colliding. So yes, it would complete our initial wish list that we've had with the LIGO and Virgo detectors. How do you know that's what you're seeing? What gives you the impression that that's what it is? Is it, is it simply the chirp? Yes, but it's also the masses of the two component objects. So that if, if a mass seems to be more than, say, five solar masses, it's presumed to be a black hole in one of these systems. And if the mass is less than about three solar masses, it's assumed to be a neutron star. And so that, this is within the framework of our generated signals template that we use to detect these very compact binary systems. So in other words, this event is looking like we have one mass in each of those two mass regions. And you determine the mass by what? The, the frequency of the gravitational wave? Yes, that's right. It's, it's a combination of things. Like our templates are, are very, included a lot of parameters, in, including the masses of the black holes, their, their spin inclination, the, the inclinations of the spins to the orbital plane. And then you can actually scale that system in distance from Earth. And that will, of course, scale the signal. So, yes, we do know for different masses and inclinations and so on what we expect the signal to look like, and uh, the amplitude gives us an indication of the distance. The data that LIGO sent NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center suggested that the lighter of the two mass objects was about three solar masses or less, which puts it nicely in the neutron star category, and there was no evidence of any disrupted material outside the final compact object. That's interesting that they could say that. Yes, and furthermore, it's interesting in general because obviously there have been a number of uh, telescopes and, and satellites looking for signatures of this event, including the ANU SkyMapper Optical Transient Telescope, and none of us have found any other signals coming from that event. So, you know, that in itself poses questions. I mean, there are a couple of main models of how we imagine a black hole and a neutron star would orbit and come together. And the first one is if, if the masses of the two objects are fairly close, then we can predict that they will orbit more times and close, get closer and closer together as they're doing so. And in that process, we would envisage that the neutron star would slowly but surely be shredded by the black hole, and we would expect in that scenario to get other signals in light and radio and so on. But the, the second possibility is if the masses of the, the black hole and neutron star are quite disparate, then the capture would happen more quickly. And so we envisage this would be more like the black hole just swallowing the neutron star hole pretty much intact. Um, and so in that scenario, we would expect not to get much in the way of other signals. So there's those two possibilities. Um, but of course, there's the other kind of really intriguing possibility is that there could possibly be black holes of very light mass. We don't know of any black holes in the universe less than about five solar masses. But, you know, who knows? With further analysis, who knows what we'll find about this, this lighter object. They've been looking for years and years using uh, gravitational microlensing for these things. They haven't found any yet. Well, that's right. So, I mean, you know, if it's not a, a black hole and a neutron star, if it's instead, you know, two black holes, then this would also be a very exciting result because it would revolutionise our thinking about black holes themselves and how they form. And that would be a big game changer as well. Assuming it is a neutron star that's being gobbled up here, the fact that it's disappeared all at once, or appears to have passed the event horizon all at once, would that tell us something about what neutron stars are really made of? Yes. 
I think we'd get further information by the shredding process mm. because we we get to have a look at the neutron star as it's being pulled apart by various other means as well. And I think, you know, that would give us more detailed... A stellar uh, autopsy. Yeah, a stellar autopsy, exactly. And that sort of stellar autopsy combined with binary neutron star coalescences will give us a lot more information about the nature and composition of neutron stars. It's exciting times, isn't it? It really is exciting times. This run of the MIGO and Virgo advanced detectors has been incredibly fruitful so far. You know, we've had quite a number of detections and uh, they're occurring on a regular basis. And as with this event, there is always the unexpected. And that's the bit I really love. The things that we're detecting now and will detect in the future that we really are not quite sure what they are. And we have to do a, a lot of work and an analysis to actually find out exactly what they are. I'm going to ask you a question without notice now, a very unfair question. There have been rumours of a possible second neutron star, neutron star merger as well during this third run. Yes, well, we announced an event event from the Anzac Day, actually, that mm -hmm. we believe was a binary neutron star merger. That one was slightly unfortunate in the sense that one of our detectors wasn't online at the time, so we couldn't get a very good sky localization. And as a result, no one was able to find the counterpart for that event. But we believe it was a binary neutron star merger. And Certainly, we would like to have some more of those. These things are not just the neutron star mergers, but the certainly the black hole mergers. These things are starting to happen, from our viewpoint at least, quite frequently. They seem to be very common throughout the universe, don't they? Yes, and all these detections we've had over the various runs, and particularly including this run, give us more and more information about the populations of these binary systems that we expect to exist out in the universe. And it, it is somewhat surprising, and obviously the more of the detections we get, get the better estimates we'll be able to place on that but you know for the moment of course we get more binary black hole collisions because these objects are much more massive uh, and, and dense, and we can see them sort of out further. That's Professor Susan Scott from the Australian National University and this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A new study claims the solar system's largest planet, the gas giant Jupiter, may have been involved in a colossal planetary collision four and a half billion years ago. A report in the journal Nature suggests that this collision gave Jupiter the strange diluted core detected by NASA's Juno spacecraft. Juno was launched from Cape Canaveral in August 2011, achieving Jovian orbit insertion five years later in July 2016. Juno uses extremely large elongated orbits to sweep over the gas giant's polar regions. The orbits are designed to avoid as much of the planet's damaging radiation belts as possible. To further protect the spacecraft from Jupiter's deadly radiation, Juno's most delicate instruments and control systems are housed in a specially shielded strongbox. The spacecraft's extreme polar orbit allows it to swoop down and skim just 3,400 kilometers above the swirling Jovian cloud tops before being taken back out to more than 8.1 million kilometres. Juno is studying the chemical composition of Jupiter's immense atmosphere and cloud structure. It's peering deep below the obscuring clouds to probe the convection currents and the thermal engines, driving the planet's circulation patterns and its spectacular surface weather features, amazing cyclonic storms and iconic salmon and cream-coloured atmospheric bands and swirls. Juno is also measuring Jupiter's gravity field to better understand the gas giant's internal structure, as well as its magnetic field, polar magnetosphere, and auroral activity. Other than the Sun, Jupiter contains more mass than the rest of the solar system combined. So, by better understanding how Jupiter formed, scientists will learn more about the formation of the rest of the solar system as well. Before Juno carried out its observations, scientists were expecting to find an Earth-sized compact rocky core at the heart of Jupiter, surrounded by a metallic hydrogen ocean hundreds of thousands of kilometres thick. Instead, Juno's very accurate gravitational readings found what appears to be a strange diluted fuzzy core, difficult to explain. Scientists now think Jupiter's core may be the result of a giant impact which occurred shortly after the planet's formation 4.5 billion years ago, which may have disrupted its original core. You see, instead of a compact core as previously assumed, Jupiter's core is, well, fuzzy. 
It comprises not only rocks and ices, but is also mixed with hydrogen and helium, and there's a gradual transition as opposed to a sharp boundary between the core and the surrounding envelope. To work out exactly what happened, scientists simulated different collision scenarios between a young Jupiter and planetary embryos. Their computer simulations eventually found a head-on planetary collision between Jupiter and a planet about 10 times the mass of the Earth would have shattered Jupiter's primordial compact core, mixing the heavy elements with the inner envelope. And depending on how the collision evolved over the following 4.5 billion years, that diluted core could still persist today. Of course, anyone who's studied the history of our solar system knows that giant planetary impacts were very common during the solar system's formation. These impacts not only explain Jupiter's diluted core, but also the formation of the Earth's moon, the high metal-to-rock fraction in Mercury, Uranus's tilt, and possibly even the backwards rotation of Venus. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. India's second lunar mission, Chandrayaan-2, has successfully entered lunar orbit. Chandrayaan-2 was launched aboard an Indian space research organization geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle, a GSLV Mark III to be precise, from the Shatish Dhawan Space Center on the Bay of Bengal coast on July the 22nd. The GSLV Mark III is the most powerful rocket India has ever built. It's a three-stage launch vehicle, with a liquid-fueled core and two strap-on solid rocket boosters for the first stage. The vehicle is designed to be capable of carrying 10 tons into low Earth orbit and 4 tons into geosynchronous transfer orbits. The Chandrayaan-2 spacecraft has used a 5-orbit raising maneuver which progressively increased its orbital apogee or furthest orbital position from the Earth until the orbit became large enough to also encompass the Moon. Chandrayaan-2 then entered its lunar transfer trajectory on August the 13th and is now undertaking a series of four lowering orbits which will eventually reduce its currently highly elongated 118 by 18,078 km lunar orbit down to a nice circular 100 by 100 km high polar orbit around the Moon by September the 1st. Using orbital raising instead of a direct lunar transfer maneuver has become the preferred way of reaching the Moon for robotic missions because it uses less fuel. On the downside, it takes about seven weeks, rather than just the three days of a direct flight. The 3,840kg Chandrayaan-2 will spend at least a year orbiting the Moon, studying its topography, mineralogy, surface chemical composition, thermophysical characteristics and exosphere. Meanwhile, the mission's 1,471kg Vikram lander and its 27kg Pragyang rover will be deployed to undertake a soft landing on the lunar surface near the South Pole on September the 7th. If successful, it'll make India only the fourth nation to soft land on the moon, following in the footsteps of the United States, the former Soviet Union, and China. Once on the surface, the rover will roll out from the lander and spend about 14 Earth days studying its surroundings and travelling up to half a kilometre from the lander during its explorations. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Final preparations are now underway to get the European Space Agency CHIOPS spacecraft ready for its launch in November. CHIOPS, which stands for the Characterizing Exoplanet Satellite, is a new space telescope designed to study the formation of extrasolar planets, that is, planets orbiting stars other than the Sun. The 300kg probe built by Airbus Defence and Space will measure photometric signals with a precision limited only by stellar photon noise. This will allow scientists to determine the size of exoplanets and follows on from ground-based observations which have already obtained stereoscopic surveys of planetary mass estimates. Scientists will then be able to estimate the density of a planet and consequently its approximate composition, including whether it's gaseous, icy or terrestrial. The data gathered by CHEOPS will tell astronomers about the nature of exoplanets and whether they have the right conditions for life. Teams of scientists and engineers are simulating the launch, early orbit phase and commissioning of the CHIOPS mission ahead of its launch aboard a Russian Soyuz STB rocket from the European Space Agency's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana. The spacecraft's pre-flight simulations are taking place at the CHIOPS Mission Operations Centre near Madrid. This report from ESA TV. In Spain, on the outskirts of Madrid, a ground station antenna sweeps the skies for a satellite. It won't find what it's searching for just yet, however, because this is a simulation. Inside the National Institute of Aerospace Technologies is the Mission Operations Centre for KEOPS 
a space telescope that will soon launch from Europe's spaceport in French Guiana. But first, the International Mission Operations Team must rehearse the in-flight activities, such as operating and monitoring the spacecraft, as well as uplinking and downlinking information. This is so that the telescope's data can flow smoothly to the Science Operations Centre in Geneva, Switzerland. We build a software simulator that actually performs the same way as the real satellite. And once, of course, the satellite is built and is ready to be shipped for launch, then we train ourselves to be able to conduct the in-orbit operations. So this involves the real launch and early orbit phase and the full in-orbit validation that will last for two months. On this training day, the team prepares for three passes, a time when the satellite is overhead and ready to send or receive information and commands. These commands can be simple, such as the spacecraft letting people know it's alive, or something more complex, like an automatic operation involving the transfer of large amounts of data. And it's not always supposed to go smoothly. We actually don't train ourselves only for the standard or expected situations but also for unexpected situations and real problems that may happen so then that's the reason why we have to to shift and we try to create problems for the other shift so that they don't know what's going to happen in the simulations and then we fake that something wrong is happening and they have to find out and of course sort it out the focus is on spacecraft control, processing data and working together as a team, realistically simulating the critical period just after launch, when the satellite begins its orbits, the instrument is switched on and its performance verified. During this time, it is important to have more visibility of what is happening in the satellite. So ESA will provide more ground stations, so instead of just four or six passes Six times you see the spacecraft during the during the day. You will have a one contact with the ground, with the satellite each 100 minutes. So it's more easy to see that everything is okay and to solve any problem. That's why uh, during this phase we will send commands not only from the routine ground station but also from ground station from the Antarctica and uh, from the close to the North Pole. Once in orbit 700 kilometers above the Earth, KOPS will examine the light from a carefully chosen list of individual bright stars beyond our solar system. These stars are known to host exoplanets. KOPS will measure the size of these planets with accuracy and precision, focusing on the smaller planets. This information will be combined with measurements from other facilities of the planet's mass to learn more about what the planets are made of, how they form and evolve. The final simulation will be performed a couple of weeks before launch. Until then, the team will repeat their manoeuvres, training until the full team is not only prepared for a perfect mission, but for any surprises too. And there you heard Diana D. McGuell from Airbus Defence and Space and David Madrigo from ISD EFE. And you're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. A new study warns that urban childcare centres should be built away from busy roads in order to minimise kids' exposure to traffic pollution. Researchers investigated levels of fine particulate matter in the air at inner-city childcare centres across Melbourne. A report in the Australian and New Zealand Journal of Public Health, based on more than three months of data, showed that the recommended maximum hourly fine particulate threshold of 25 nanograms per cubic metre was breached on multiple occasions. Of the 278 identified inner suburban childcare centres, some 14% were within 60 metres of a major road. The study's authors have recommended that Australian policy emulate California, where a reduction in children's pollution exposure has been linked to measurable health improvements. A new study of planet Earth's worsening global climate change situation is now warning that Arctic sea ice could disappear completely through September each summer if average global temperatures increase by as little as 2 degrees. The findings by scientists at the University of Cincinnati show that September Arctic sea ice will effectively disappear between about 2 and 2.5 degrees of global warming. 
The study, which is reported in the journal Nature Communications, concludes that the less summer sea ice the Arctic has, the longer it takes the Arctic Ocean to ice back over the polar winter. Scientists say that would spell bad news for Arctic wildlife such as seals and polar bears, which rely on sea ice to raise pups and feed. There's a new cyber security warning out following the discovery of BlueKeep, a widespread vulnerability that allows access to computers running older versions of Windows Vista, Windows 7, Windows XP, Server 2003 and Server 2008. The Australian Cyber Security Centre says hackers are using the BlueKeep vulnerability to access computers and devices that don't have the latest Windows software updates. Once a device is infected, BlueKeep can spread malware to other computers and devices on the same network, including devices which have access to remote desktop environments. The Cyber Security Centre warns that any organisations or individuals using older versions of Windows operating systems should immediately install Windows BlueKeep vulnerability software updates. A new analysis of helium isotopes locked inside super-deep diamonds hundreds of kilometres below Earth's surface suggests the presence of vast reservoirs of molten primordial source rock nearly as old as the planet itself. A report in the journal Science claims the helium-bearing diamonds provide the first and most direct record of the variation of helium isotope compositions below Earth's lithosphere. The isotopic compositions of volcanic rocks formed from magma once stored deep in the mantle are important, as these compositions provide crucial information about the chemical reservoirs of Earth's interior. Of these, helium isotopes are one of the best tools for understanding the nature of the very deepest and oldest parts of Earth's mantle. Previous studies of helium isotopes have suggested that regions below the upper mantle could hold pristine reservoirs of primordial rock material. Scientists located a set of diamonds that form deep beneath the Earth in an area of Brazil, known for its super-deep diamonds. As these diamonds formed in the transition zone of the mantle at depths spanning from 410 to 660 kilometres, helium and other elements became trapped in the tiny fluid inclusions within the minerals. The authors measured the isotopes of the captured elements and found extreme isotope variability, but also very high helium-3 to helium-4 ratios, suggesting the existence of a deep primordial source of helium that occasionally infiltrates the transition zone, and then mixes with subducting material from above, creating diverse isotopic compositions recorded in basalts. A new study has shown that despite common belief, it turns out women are no better at multitasking than men. A report in the journal PLOS One compared the abilities of 48 men and 48 women performing tasks that involved paying attention to a single task, two tasks at once, known as concurrent multitasking, or quickly switching attention between two tasks, called sequential multitasking. Scientists found multitasking affected the speed and accuracy of both men and women. While it was a small study, scientists say the findings suggest that men and women do just as well or just as poorly as each other when they're trying to multitask. You're listening to Space Time, I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 